In my previous video, I made this pair of bookshelf speakers. Now, while they look pretty great and they sound great, what they seriously lack is some bass. So I decided the next logical project would be to build a subwoofer to complement these speakers, which now live permanently on my desk. In a moment of what I could only assume was questionable judgment, I decided to use my brand new 3D printer's approximately one cubic foot build volume to try and make this subwoofer in as few pieces as possible. This is the outcome of this particular venture. Don't worry, the size disparity isn't lost on me and I'll try and explain later. The objective of this build was to provide more base for the existing desk speakers. I was aiming for a sealed enclosure that could reproduce that tight, accurate bass that's great for music, which is primarily what I listen to at my desk. The inherent challenge, however, lies in the fact that sealed subwoofers need to have a decent internal volume, be airtight, and have exceptionally rigid walls in order to perform adequately as a sub. While 3D printing excels at creating complex three-dimensional geometry, achieving airtight, structurally rigid prints usually involves consuming, frankly, excessive amounts of filament and time. Taking inspiration from others who have made large DIY speakers, I opted to use Plaster of Paris, which is cost-effective, readily available, and is a great rigid wall filling for the enclosure. I was initially concerned about a double-shell wall design delaminating due to the size of the enclosure we wanted to print. My proposed improvement involved using the unique continuous volume property of gyroid infill, intending to fill that internal structure with plaster, creating some sort of plaster-plastic matrix. Regarding the constraints for the project, the primary one was that the subwoofer would need to be reasonably compact in order to fit under my desk. That requirement, coupled with the recent purchase of my new Bamboo H2D 3D printer, not sponsored by the way, led to the logical conclusion that compact should be defined as the absolute maximum possible dimension that this printer can produce. Conventional wisdom suggests you select a driver that has the frequency response that you're looking for, and then you design and build an enclosure to suit. But here, we embrace chaos. So with the enclosure size fixed, I set out to find a driver that would perform adequately in the enclosure. With no deep expertise in driver selection, I did what any self-respecting millennial would do. I asked our AI overlords for help. I coerced it into making calculations and driver recommendations for the resulting 0.8 cubic foot build volume that my printer could produce. And after fact-checking the information with my own calculations and online forums, I procured this 10-inch Dayton Audio reference driver which theoretically would perform exceptionally in my enclosure. I also tested out Gemini's deep research feature when doing this research. I'll leave a link in the description to the research paper for those curious. With the methodology questionable and the components selected, I started the design process. The design itself aimed to echo the Fibonacci-inspired aesthetic of the bookshelf speakers. I incorporated some copper ring accents, which are spaced according to the golden ratio but the overriding priority remained respecting the 0.8 cubic foot internal volume needed for our driver, which led to this fairly conventional box shape. It also has some internal bracing, which is necessary for wall rigidity and a cutout on the back for the terminal cup. Conceptually, the design seems sound. The transition from digital to physical design would prove less than straightforward, however. I had decided to print the front, the back, and the main walls of the enclosure separately in order to save on print time and filament. My well thought out plan was to pour the walls and the front cap and then somehow attach the rear cap later. Now you're probably thinking, that's dumb. And you're right, but I didn't know that yet. In an unrelated issue, the 4% gyroid infill that I had selected to conserve filament immediately had print quality issues related to bridging and overhangs. This was as much a design issue as it was a print setting issue, and while reprinting with adjusted settings was an option, I had run out of the grey PETG I was using. Being as impatient as I am, I couldn't wait two days for more to arrive, which led to the sophisticated solution of slapping some tape over the holes. Before starting to play with the plaster, I ran a brief and ultimately inconclusive experiment. I wanted to compare plaster mixed with latex or plaster mixed with PVA or wood glue. I think I was hoping to magically make some acoustically superior material with the latex. I had read that you could mix latex with plaster, but I couldn't find any information about what it did to the acoustic properties of the plaster, whereas there was some evidence of PVA and wood glue mixed with plaster creating a acoustically superior material. In the end though, they both sounded the same when I hit them with a the spanner. Also breaks very easily. 
With that, I proceeded to mix my first batch of plaster and pour it into the gyro infill. I first poured the front cap and then the walls, using any spare plaster to fill in the rear cap. To be clear, I don't know if this was ever going to work, but here was the thinking. If I flip the still drying housing on top of the freshly poured end cap, then the plaster would mix and fuse the whole thing together. Shortly after, I got scared that it wouldn't hold, so I doubled down and put a thick bead of silicon sealant to try and hold it all together. So, I have a little bit of a problem because <clears throat> you can see here, it's lifting off. We're just going to have to let it dry now and then hope that the back doesn't fall off when we pick it up for the first time. Yeah, let's just wait and see. Anyway, after three days of waiting, I realized the silicon had expired because it still wasn't drying. Um, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this very well, but it's, it's still soft. Like you can literally just, you can peel it off. Um, and that's after three days, which I just don't think is right. This, this silicon is about uh, maybe two years old. So I think it's just not, gonna, not going to properly cure. I also started to think that the plaster was too brittle to hold itself together. And putting it on the workbench to give it a test confirmed my theory. One of the things I was worried about was whether the tape was what was holding on the front cap. And I just tested, I did a little tug test to see if this lifts up and it does. So I think if I, pick this up by the face, it's just all going to fall off. Oh, well, not quite, but it definitely wants to fall off. Yeah, that's, yeah, fuck. Okay. Let me see if I can pry it apart. Yeah, okay, there we go. I mean, that shouldn't come away that easily. All right. Well, this is a big old fail. Ah, that's disappointing. This structural failure provided definitive, if slightly disheartening proof that I had the wrong idea. So I retired attempt number one. So for attempt number two, I reverted to the double shell wall design, which was more tried and tested. The design was largely the same as the original design. I just split the main enclosure into these two shell pieces. I also split the front cap into a few different pieces so I could pour the front cap with the walls. And uh, you'll see what I mean in a minute. My first print of attempt number two came out with an incredible warp. Despite that, I still considered using it, wondering if people would notice. For attempt number three, I implemented some preventative measures. I increased the wall thickness from 1.2 millimeters to 1.8 millimeters, and I added these vertical struts to help prevent the warping during print. This finally yielded usable results. To complete the assembly, I installed these standoffs to preserve the void between the inside and the outside shell. I then added the internal braces salvaged from attempt number one, and then meticulously sealed any gaps that I could find with flex glue that I found in the cupboard. Then we were back to pouring plaster. I still hadn't perfected the technique. I found using a drill mixer caused the plaster to thicken up too quickly, so I resorted back to old fashioned methods. Ah. 
Unfortunately, I ran out of plaster just short of completion. So I had to make a quick midnight run to the shops to pick up some more. Once I mixed up and applied the final batch of plaster, I was able to come back later once it had dried, smooth it out, and then apply the front plate. The result was an extraordinarily dense and solid enclosure. With six kilograms of plaster mixed at a one and a half to one ratio with water, combined with the two kilograms of PETG from the prints, we were looking at an enclosure that weighed about 12 kilograms before adding the driver. Not bad. Okay. Conveniently, just at this point, the driver we had ordered arrived, giving us a chance to confirm for the very first time that the driver fits in the hole we left for it. After having spent two weeks on two failed attempts, about five kilograms of PETG and about 12 kilograms of plaster, thankfully, it did. With the core structure complete, we now need to look at the finishing details to make this thing resemble the design we set out with. This involved the usual cleaning, sanding, and surface preparation. For painting, I used the original textured paint used on the original speakers to try and tie the aesthetic together. I also can't understate my joy that when I picked it up by the face for the very first time, this time, didn't fall apart. Installing the spiked feet was the first post-painting step in order to prevent damaging the finish. I find this textured paint scuffs easily, so I had to touch it up quickly. I then soldered the internal wiring to the terminal cup The next step was to start assembly. I pre-installed these heat inserts, but I didn't record it. And here I am casually trying to pick up a 300 degrees Celsius heat insert. I bought this Bane mask looking thing during this project because I finally realized I should probably try and look after my lungs. Protect yourself, guys. I was setting up here actually to solder the wires to the driver, but I realized at the very last minute that they've got these spring clip terminals, so that was awesome. Finally, the enclosure needed some acoustic dampening, so I liberated 0.8 pounds from my girlfriend's body pillow. This is just some polyester stuffing, nothing fancy, but it serves the purpose. And so, with the assembly finally complete, it was time for the initial audio test. I uh, didn't realize how huge this thing looks. I mean, I could push it all the way back and it will look a little bit less uh, obnoxious. I'm gonna set you up here and I'm gonna turn it on for the first time. I do realize this is not gonna be a great sound test, but uh, I just wanna capture my live reaction. <laughs> when the bass kicks in, that is wild. I'm worried that you can hear that through like the walls. As you may have just seen, this thing is obnoxious. Um, yeah. Literally within seconds, my girlfriend had texted me from upstairs saying my subwoofer was loud. Now, I'm no audiophile, but I am an engineer. So you would think I should understand the implications of having a sealed 10 inch subwoofer in a close proximity urban living environment, especially for a setup located less than 10 feet from my neighbor's ears. But did I? Upon turning up the volume for the very first time, my heart genuinely sank. It sank because I started to consider that I might genuinely not have a practical use for what I've built here. It's a case of the classic engineering hubris. I was so preoccupied with the can I that I never stopped to think, should I? The conclusion though was unavoidable. The project was technically successful, maybe excessively so.
I didn't despair long though. After a little bit of EQing to cut out some of the very lowest frequencies which have a tendency to travel easily through solid surfaces, I've got it to a place where I can enjoy it dialed all the way back. I'm now just waiting for the opportunity to have the space to put this thing through its paces. The final aesthetic touches involved adding these decorative copper silk PLA rings, installing this matching facade over the driver mounting screws, and then putting on these little socks that I made for the spiked feet to cover up the brass. I also made a matching pair for the bookshelf speakers just so everything tied together nicely. This all led to something that will serve wonderfully as a footrest. And there you have it. A project driven by an arbitrary constraint and resulting in a subwoofer that exceeded my wildest expectations. Now this is the part of the video where I should be measuring frequency response to try and demonstrate scientifically how it performs and to test how it performs to the theoretical design we started out with. But unfortunately I don't own a reference microphone and being a small channel it's not really in my budget yet. So for this one you're just going to have to take my word for it that it sounds fantastic. What are your thoughts on the project? I'd be interested to hear your opinions in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing. It means a lot to me. See you in the next one. What do you think of it? No? Oh.